Well, welcome everyone to another Maine SBDC event. My name is Kelsey Reardon, and we are very lucky to have certified business advisor Chris Cole with us today for a bootstrapping your restaurant webinar. Uh, we'll be hitting on things like efficiency and resourcefulness and soup, all the important points. Um, we are based out of the USM Portland office. Chris and I are on that state team, but because we are all working from home, we are working within some technology limitations. So throughout this presentation, Chris will be sharing her screen, but you might notice that her uh, video is off. That's just to ensure that we have a really strong connection, um, but she'll be back for the Q&A section at the end. After the event, you will receive a follow-up email from me that will have a link to the recording of the event as well, as well as the slides and all of our contact information. Uh, like I said, we are the main small business development center and we are here to help small businesses in whatever way we can. So we have resources available. We just launched a relaunch and recovery resource center, which is based specifically in responding to COVID issues within businesses. But we also just launched the first few in our e-course series. So we have a couple of modules available now that are starting businesses, making marketing plans. We'll go into financing. There's going to be a whole bunch of courses that are on demand. So definitely check that out. I'll have a link of for that in the email as well. Um, the rest of the time, you know, we're here. Uh, we offer that one-on-one -on -one free confidential business advising uh, with our certified business advisors. That's how we serve you best. So definitely feel free to reach out if you have more specific questions about getting a restaurant started. Chris's contact information will be in that email as well. Uh, we're very lucky to have Chris presenting today. She has over 20 years of experience at, uh, starting, running, selling, starting restaurants again. She's, uh, she has done this several times, so she knows what she's talking about, uh, and she'll be a great resource for anyone who is getting started. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to her. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Kelsey. I just want to say good morning to everyone and thanks for attending this webinar. It really is my hope that you'll gain some insights to help cut costs and grow your food business. You know, 40% of new restaurants actually do succeed in their first year. Of that, only 20% survive past year five. According to experts, the most common reasons for failure of the business are low startup capital, poor knowledge about competition, and bad location. From my personal experience, failure is due to poor planning, lack of imagination, and not enough motivation. No, I have not run a restaurant during a pandemic, but I did buy one at the peak of the economy in 2006 and weathered a lot of changes to eventually sell it 13 years later. My original title for this webinar was how I overpaid for a restaurant, was undercapitalized, survived the recession, made it a success, not once, but twice. So to set the stage here, I, along with a business par partner, purchased a greasy spoon in North Yarmouth. Before we signed a contract or put up our individual homes as a collateral, we made a business plan. We also negotiated an owner financing agreement. That was a loan at eight and a half percent. That was the going rate then. Amortized over a 20 year period with a balloon payment at year seven and no prepayment penalty. For us, that meant if we <clears throat> were smart enough, we could get it paid off by year seven. A separate company owned the building. We signed a lease agreement with them. So doing the homework, I had estimated we needed 30,000 for working capital. Unfortunately, we could only come up with 20,000. 
So it gets better from here. See, we were so excited to have our own place. We really did not inspect the facilities with a fine eye. Much of the equipment was at the end of its useful life. And the former owners, they left the place filthy. The electricity kept cutting out the first weekend we were open. In hindsight, we should have exercised that three-day right of rescission clause and walked away. Instead, we charged forward. So before you hang out that opening open flag, do the business plan. In my opinion, a business plan is like a roadmap. When you plan a trip, you pick a desired destination. Then you plot a course to get there. When you set out to have a restaurant or any other business, know where it is you want to go with it and the steps you need to take to get there. The plan takes time, research, and thoughtful consideration. And just a little plug here, the SBDC, that's what we do, we'll help you with it. <clears throat> so before purchasing the restaurant, we hired three key professionals, the accountant, attorney, and the, our insurance agent. And let me tell you, having good insurance is essential. I'll explain that one later. So your CPA, they help your business with tax filing, They'll structure your balance sheet, calculate depreciation. They also know deductions and credits for your industry. They will provide you with sound financial advice for the growth of your business. The attorney will assist you in creating your entity. In my case, it was an S Corp. And they also understand the various regulations you need to be aware of. And they'll help you in all types of legal matters. It really is important to establish these relationships from the beginning. Now, I was my own bookkeeper. However, you may not have the time or aptitude to do that part of your business. But you know what? Bookkeepers, they actually save your business money. They handle everything from paying bills on time to preparing financial statements for your review and for your accountant at tax time. Choosing to hire a bookkeeper, though, that does not excuse you from keeping a handle on your finances. You need to do your weekly reviews. And for payroll services, now there's all kinds of options out there, but I chose to hire a local company. And for me, it was such a relief not to have to worry about processing forms or missing tax filing deadlines. We paid our 23 employees bi-weekly. My last year in operation, it cost $1,558, including all of the reports. That is just $59 a pay period, something I thought was well worth it. Point of sale systems, there's a lot of options for those nowadays. We had a cash register and buying a point of sale system was not in our budget. Seven years in, I finally did get it. This is what I call the bacon factor. See, when servers had to write tickets, they would inevitably come back to the kitchen. They or their customer forgot to order a side of bacon, hash, fruit, muffin, whatever it was. And when you're managing a busy restaurant with a slide full of checks, you just can't stop. Pull the ticket and write on it. So even though we reminded servers to charge for sides, it didn't always happen. The first week of having a POS, the per ticket sales increased by 8%. So when I started my business, a regular bank was the only place you could have a business banking account. It wasn't until recently that we've had a choice for our banking needs. Credit unions are smaller and they fees are minimal. I went from paying $63 per month with a big bank to paying $7 per month with a credit union. That's a cost savings of $672 per year. You want to establish good money habits from the beginning. Pay as you go. My motto was, if I didn't have the cash to buy it, we didn't need it. The exception would be 0% financing for a fixed term. And when I did that, I budgeted equal monthly payments so there were no surprises at the end. Pay your bills on time. This builds credit for the business and good relationships with your vendors. The higher your credit score, the more options you have. 
file and pay your taxes on time, because if you don't, then you incur interest and penalties. So menu planning, the leaner the menu and the more you can utilize crossover items, the less inventory to manage. That reduces food waste and food costing. If you don't know how much it costs you, then how can you properly price it? Standardize your recipes. Your staff should be able to replicate the taste, look, and quantity of every item you make. Make prep lists, be organized. Having PARs will reduce over prepping and having to throw out items or under prepping and running out, which is a loss of sales. You still have to pay your staff whether or not they are productive. So turn that labor cost into revenue. And another thing I would do here, I would have my dishwasher do the dry muffin mix for me. So at $12 an hour for the dishwasher versus $17 for the baker, that would save me $5 an hour in labor on that one item. <clears throat> So what you don't have in money, you have to make up for with muscle. Be prepared to work 12 to 17 hours a day, seven days a week. In my situation, my business partner and I, we both had the skills to be whatever position was necessary. Plus, we had a great family support system, which meant free labor or labor in exchange for food. And you know, this is good for the beginning, but eventually you will need to fill those positions with employees. All right, so we've got you all set up. You're open. Now it's all about controlling the cost moving forward. So store like things together, be consistent. I know it sounds really simple, but this will expedite the process when taking inventory, putting away orders, and more importantly, during a rush. It's really stressful when you need a package of gluten-free hamburger rolls and your prep cook says, I can't find them. And you know what? Make your distributors compete for your business. They're in sales too. I had three distributors for large quantity items. Whomever had the lowest price got the order. For eggs, the per case price could be as much as a $5 difference. And we used 15 to 20 cases every week. So that's a savings of 3,900 to 5,200 annually. Check in your orders. You know, I know the drivers are in a hurry, but you pay really good money for this product. Don't accept damaged goods. Open the cases of produce. Check the dates on the milk. Make sure that you actually get what you ordered. And it's not fun on a Sunday to open a case of rotten mushrooms and to have to send somebody to Hannaford's, it's a 45 minute round trip and it wastes time and money. And the last thing I say here is always have a we need list, empower your staff to be responsible to write it down when they take the last of something. <clears throat> so this is my aha moment here. Um, I actually took the picture of the spice rack there four years ago I walked into Shop and Save and they had just introduced their private label spices. Even my Cisco salesman said he couldn't come close to that price. It was a big savings. And if you can't use a whole case of something before it spoils, then don't order it. Small quantities like fresh produce are often less expensive at the grocery store and you have better control of the quality. It's awful when you open a case of all unripe avocados. So you can pick what you need when you go to the grocery store. And another trick, I would have farmer's markets. I would purchase large quantities of native strawberries and rhubarb in season, clean and freeze them for later use. And lots of times my customers would actually bring me their abundance of rhubarb from their garden. With wholesale clubs, they tend to have better prices on wraps, foils, and baking ingredients. Using my BJ's credit card, I earned cash towards future purchases, an annual savings of $500. And a bonus here, the gas is a lot cheaper. So the RoboQ, it, and it doesn't have to be a RoboQ brand, but this is my favorite piece of equipment. 
not only does it save money and time, it saves wear and tear on your human resources. I still have carpal tunnel in both my hands, um, and I don't know about anybody else, but this will prevent younger people from having the same issue. So why buy new when used will do? Muffins, they don't care if they get baked in the used blodget or the new one, as long as the results are the same. The $600 oven I bought 14 years ago is still turning out thousands of dollars of bakery items per week. When buying used, auctions are good, but make sure that you know the book value of items you wanna purchase. You can get into a bidding war and overpay. It, it, Kind of, it really can be a frenzy situation. So I wanted to change from the tired white plates that we had, and I had a little bit of money to make the changes. I wanted to go to something bright and new, Fiesta Ware. You know, it's really pretty, but it's pretty expensive at $14 a dinner plate. Or I had the option to go with the dollar store, <clears throat> excuse me, and I needed 75 plates. That's $1,275 versus $75. $1,200 I could spend somewhere else. And I have worked in other restaurants who had Fiesta Wear. They really do break the same. Plastics, that's another big investment when you're starting out. We washed and reused sour cream containers, feta buckets, and other plastic containers that food came in. That was a big cost savings actually didn't start buying Cambros until probably five or six years in, and I still continued to wash out the sour cream containers and the feta buckets. So this one tool maybe cost you about three or five dollars, but it will save you a lot of money. It's common sense, but scrape out the ketchup and mayonnaise containers, the mixing bowl, your roasting pan, the stock pot, the food processor, and train your staff to do the same thing. Lost product is lost servings, which equals lost profit. By scraping out the mixing bowl, I could get another muffin and at a selling price of $3.25 each, open six days a week, that's $19.50 every week. So portion controls here, lobster salad, for my menu, that was one of the most expensive items we carried. And for this product, I would use souffle cups, weigh and portion each one. Then I'd count the number of portions to make sure I didn't lose a sale here. And pre-portioned chicken breasts, they're great for uniformity, but they can cost $2 more per pound than if you buy the random chicken breasts and do the portioning yourselves. Plus save the trimmings from the chicken breast, you can use them for stock. Also using scoops. When you do that, write it on the recipe. If you use the green scoop for your chocolate chip cookies, write green scoop on that recipe. And keep your recipes in page protectors that will save from having to replace them. Also making and freezing raw doughs ahead. That saved us money on labor. And if you're opening baker oversleeps, which it happens, it takes a lot less time for someone to pull the scones from the freezer and bake than making a batch from scratch. It gets out to the customer faster because if you, if they can't see it, you don't sell it. Prime rib. A prime rib weighs about 15 pounds, usually costs $100. After selling the first four king cuts at $30 each, you've pretty much paid the food costs on the rib. So the other nine portions, they're profit. Also wash all your vegetables before prepping. Save the carrot and onion peelings, the celery tops and the mushroom stems for stock. Use every bit of every item. Be creative here. This really was how we saved a lot of money in my restaurant was we would use everything with soup, and it, and it really is. So when we bought the place, the original owners had that big eight-yard dumpster. So we went, within the first couple of months, we realized we weren't even using half the capacity. We went from that eight-yard dumpster to a four-yard dumpster. 
We recycle everything possible, cardboard, glass, plastic, you name it. Um, and then we would give the food waste to pig farmers and the vegetable scrap to local gardeners for their compost. The money from bottle deposits was put in a slush fund, excuse me, in a slush fund for our staff party. So repairs, this is often called the unforeseen expense. You really can't plan for them. Stuff is gonna break. Things are gonna need to be fixed. And you know, lots of times plumbers and electricians, they're already your customers. I had an electrician that would do work in exchange for lunches and a plumber that billed for the materials and would take a gift card for the amount of his labor. So do it yourself. With the help of friends, over the years, I laid floors, built shelves, put up sheetrock, painted the restaurant multiple times. And in 2017, we did a complete renovation. Also, I had a staff member and she really enjoyed gardening. So I put her in charge of the exterior of the restaurant and she made it beautiful. This cost me a lot less money than paying a landscaper. And having a monthly weekly cleaning list that keeps your staff organized and extends the life of your equipment. My expression in the restaurant was, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean. So having that list was really handy. I just say, pick this item and do it. Um, your furnace and your air conditioning systems, they need annual service. So make sure that you schedule those because if you have to call somebody in on the weekend, typically they charge double the hourly rate for emergency calls. So knowing who your customer is, that's key to reaching them. Initially, when we first got the restaurant, my customers were blue collar workers, a lot of retired folks, and we had families on the weekend. The majority of people in the North Yarmouth area, they read the notes or the Falmouth forecaster. So that is where I spent a good amount of my advertising dollars. But <clears throat> as the demographics changed, so did my strategy. And we moved into social media as well as television. And while we're here, I just wanna to touch upon wholesaling for the purposes of marketing. When we first opened, people in the area, they didn't even realize there was a new owner. They didn't realize we had changed the menu from a diner to a cafe and bakery. So Sweets are out, Sweetser's Apple Barrel, just four miles down the road from us was my first account. I bought apples from them and they sold my pies with my label, which had the address, phone number, website, and hours of operation. Plus, they let me leave menus for customers to take. The next key account for me was 1912 Cafe in L.L. Bean. They sold my cookies and muffins, even whoopie pies, again with our labels. Both of those accounts helped to increase our market share and ultimately diversified our customer base. Wall calendar. We had a big wall calendar in the prep room with important dates on it. Everyone can see it and you can plan for it. Our big season was pie season. We would start advertising in October, which meant we could sell over 200 pies every Thanksgiving. All right, so you know in the beginning how I said Good insurance is essential. It really is. I had my safe stolen out of the restaurant with a week's worth of deposits. For us, that was 5,500 around in cash. After my deductible, the insurance company replaced $5,000 of that money. That's something that, that was payroll. We, we couldn't live without that, it was huge. Um, and unfortunately, within a month of that happening, a former employee who was disgruntled, she had not returned her key, she stole 20 years worth of work, the master recipe book. Luckily, fortunately, I had a duplicate set of recipes at my house. So always make copies of your recipes and keep them home. Those two events led me to get an alarm system so in North Yarmouth, you know, it's like a small town and you never thought you just locked the door with a key and nobody bothered you. But 
those two events really made me realize we needed an alarm system and it was a great investment. We used a local company and paying the monitoring fee was probably about $30 per quarter. So menu updating. <clears throat> you know, I think most of us undervalue what we do. We have a hard time raising prices. And during the recession, I did not raise my prices. It really was do or die. I watched so many other small businesses fold and we had to keep the doors open or I feared I would lose my house. After though, I clued into making small adjustments more often. And you know what? I still had customers tell me I didn't charge enough. In the 13 years, I had three major demographic changes still holding on to core customers. So you really need to pay attention to who your customer is today and what the food trends are, what their dietary needs are, and make adjustments as you go along with that. Failure is not an option. This was the motto from day one. We said it every single day for years. Um, you wanna work alongside your crew. There was not one thing I would ask my staff to do that I had not done a hundred times myself. I thank my staff every day during their shifts and especially before they went home. I thank my customers, my suppliers, the delivery drivers, my plow guy, you name it, I appreciated them because without them, I didn't have a business. <clears throat> Moving the office out of the restaurant, one of the best things I ever did because I was always distracted trying to get paperwork done and put it on the schedule. Wednesday was my paperwork day. And it's not important just to be paying the bills, but you really need to know where your money is going to. And it gave me time to create my ads, change menus, all kinds of other things that needed to be done for the business. And you know what? You can't be all things to all people. I used to have customers ask me to do all kinds of special stuff. Um, one of the big ones was either catering events or because we were a bakery, they wanted us to make elaborate wedding cakes. And these things, they may seem like a good opportunity, but lots of times they distract from your core business. So I would just politely tell customers, I don't cater. <clears throat> your staff, these people represent your brand. They are key to your success. Treat them well and it will pay dividends. Recognize the contributions to their business. Because according to peoplekeep.com, it cost $3,328 on average to replace an entry level employee. Also promote from within. Sometimes the best hire for position already works in your business. Many times I took a dishwasher, turned them into a prep cook, and eventually they worked beside me on the line. And in the picture here in the center, five of those folks in the staff photo worked for me in the past and they came back to help me rebuild my business. This was my favorite part of owning a restaurant, getting to know my customers and having relationships. The gentleman <clears throat> holding the pie is Theron, um, one of my longest standing customers and I've been part of his life and he's been part of mine ever since. So good customers, they are your best advertising and they bring in more customers. We used to have a customer appreciation day. It was one of my favorite things to do. And the customers, they loved it. We had music and free food and door prizes. And we had raffles. We had other businesses that would donate gift certificates and items to this. It was just a, a really nice community event. Also host charity events, especially if it's a cause you believe in. That heart dinner we did every year, and it was the second biggest fundraiser for that organization annually. Join associations and clubs in your area, whether it's the Rotary Club, the Lions Club. In our case, we were members of the local business association. Also donate gift certificates. Being the only restaurant in town, we were asked for donations 
by every organization and fundraising group possible. I gave each one the same amount along with my menu and a nice envelope. It was a $25 gift certificate. And more often than not, people spend more than what is on the gift certificate. And lots of times they would give it to friends and family that hadn't been to the restaurant as a gift. So it was a bonus, you'd get some new customers out of it. And you know, if you don't have the $25, it can be $10 gift certificate, just be consistent with everybody. So that's my dog, Ivan, on the laptop, not really happy that mom has to go back to the restaurant, which is what happened. I told you in the beginning, there were some ups and downs. So in 2010, I bought out my business partner and continued to grow the business. In 2013, I paid off that one big loan. That was a huge weight off my shoulders. Later in that same year, I sold the restaurant using the same terms that I had, be had been given. So this time I was the bank, but unfortunately it didn't work out. Two years later, I came back to a shell of a business that I had left. I had a decision to make and it wasn't easy, but I put on my big girl pants and decided I was gonna rebuild my restaurant. And actually <clears throat> I made, called my vendor Cisco, called my bank, reset up the credit card system. And I made two key calls to staff members and I had a full staff. I think it took me all of three weeks to get back up and running. So there's not one magic solution here. There isn't any trick. There's not a money tree. You know, you have to be all in every day when you're running a business <clears throat> and you have to be willing to make adjustments as you go. So now I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna emerge and I'll take any questions people have. Thank you, Chris. Uh, like I said, she knows what she's talking about because she did it a couple of times. <laughs> Uh, so if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat feature right at the bottom. Um, we are also a pretty small group if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask a more complica complicated question. Uh, we'll definitely have Chris, Chris's come. I'm getting twist, tongue twat. Even my tongue twister is getting twisted. Uh, we will have Chris's contact information as well as the main SBDC's contact information in the follow-up email um, so that if you had really specific questions about your own restaurant, uh, we could get you set up with a one-on-one -on -one business advising session. But right now we have Chris's full undivided attention. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have one. Hi. Me is strong uh, here. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi. Um, so, how do you go about like we're we have a list of equipment that we're we're looking to buy. We own a brewery. We're we're looking to add food to our our thing to kind of fill in um, our food trucks that are not here all the time, but are you know we're open seven days a week. We don't always have a food truck, so we're trying to fill in a space. So we're. We're trying to do a really simple menu, um, and then we're 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 looking at equipment. So you mentioned like buy, like look to used equipment. Um, how do you know how to value it and where you know like um, sure. what what's a good price? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what I would do, especially before I would go to an auction, because lots of times the auction companies will list what the items are that are going to be auctioned off. So what I would do is I would go Webstrot, it's called, uh, yeah, so it's like restaurant and web put together, webstrot.com, and I'll get that more correct. But anyways, I would go to their website, or I would go to independentrestaurantsupply.com, um, they're a local company, and I would see what the retail price was on the items that I actually wanted to purchase before I would go. Um, it's harder to get a used value opinion on something, but if you know how much it would be new, used should be at least half that price. 
depending on the piece of equipment. So like you saw like the Blodgett oven there, um, you know, that was like what, one quarter of the price, even less than that of what a new one was. Great, thank you. Yep. Yeah, and just in that vein, like do your research with new stuff. What are your dream items? What do you wanna fill your kitchen with? Uh, and then keep in, you could decide what you wanted to prioritize for new things versus used items and then add those things to your auction list to keep an eye out for. And sort of, if you're not in a rush, you can be a little more st strategic about it. Right. And there's a couple pieces of equipment that I'd be really leery of buying used. Um, you saw the Roboku I had pictured there. I bought that new. They, the motors last a long, long time, but you never know how people handle them. Those, those plastic bowls that, you know, the tabs and stuff can break and you may have a misconnection there. Um, refrigeration, you definitely want to make sure that you test it out before you leave. Um, I kind of glossed over cleaning the compressors, but when I was running a different business in the Portland public market, uh, before we opened, they had been doing everything to the market. So there was dust flying around. And I think we were about three months in when our refrigeration went down. Well, it was because the compressor was sucking up all the dust in the market. Um, so there's easy tricks to clean compressors. You can actually just get a pressurized handheld spray washer and just spray down the compressor. We would do that on a weekly basis. Um, so for sure. But if you can test things out, you know, if somebody's selling it directly, ask them to demonstrate it for you so you, you know it works before you take it away. You need that test drive. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Got a quiet group today. Actually, I have another one if no one's going to it. Go for it. <laughs> Um, pricing structure. So like I said, we own a brewery, so I have a, a good idea of pricing structure for that. Um, adding, f you know, food into that it, it is something different. Is there a set pricing structure, you know, um, for uh, how you're pricing or is it really kind of uh, what you're serving market dependent, that type of thing? Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what the market will bear is ultimately going to be your highest price. And, um, you know, it's funny because we used to do a Saturday night dinner and we had a lot of people that would come in from like Portland area, Cape Elizabeth and stuff. And they always were blown away at how, you know, inexpensive our stuff was, but it was based on our location. I always said if I was in downtown Portland, I could be charging probably twice what I was charging. But the really the key thing is, Maya, is for you guys to use the food costing calculators. Um, the one that I put on that slide there is a link to a free one, but you can also pay to have, you know, be to get one on a regular basis as a software program, but at least break down the items that you wanna put on your menu so you know how much it costs you per, per, per portion. Um, back many years ago when I was in culinary school, the rule of thumb was three times the food price but that's not really accurate anymore because all your other costs have gone up. Um, so, you know, you just need to figure out what your food costs and then look at what the market will bear and figure out the margins that you need to cover your expenses. Um, and that's something if you, when you get ready, I'd be happy to take a look at whatever you have and help you with it. Yeah, and those slides from today will be in my follow-up email. So that link will be accessible to everyone. Great. One other question then. <laughs> um, so is there a guideline kind of that you see for um, what, when you should go to a bank and take a loan for equipment versus what you should be purchasing out of pocket when you're already in an existing business? You know, like we, we have cash reserves and it's like, okay, do we buy this piece of equipment outright as opposed to taking a loan for it? Where, where, where's a good, is there a good guideline, do you feel, for that? Right. 
Well, I mean, the thing is, is it really depends on what the interest rate on the loan is. And if the capital that you have in your accounts, you need in reserve. So like, you know, one of the things for me was, and, and I think a lot of businesses, a lot of restaurants per se, was I had to get through the winter because I was open year round. So in the fall, you know, if I would have needed something really key, I would look to get financing for it as opposed to um, paying cash for it if I could avoid it because I needed to make sure I needed, I knew how much I needed for my payroll and plowing and stuff like that, all those winter expenses. And I held on to that money. Um, interest rates right now are, are fairly good. Another thing is like, um, which I forgot to put, I had put in my slide, but I took it out. But like leasing a dish machine, that was like one of the biggest cost saving things I ever did. I had bought a brand new Hobart dish machine. I was so excited, paid cash for it. Um, when I transitioned over to the new owners of my restaurant, they didn't maintain it. So I needed to replace it. And um, leasing the dish machine only cost me, I think it was about $150 a month but they did all the service on it. And every two years, they'll update that machine for you. So, you know, that could be a possibility like leasing and you can also do leasing to own depending on the equipment that you want. Thank you. Uh, Christine, I have a question for you regarding leasing uh, dish machines. Who are you using? We're you using Ecolab or some other company? Well, I did it through Cisco. And they had Ecolab, but then um, when I, so I sold, finally sold my restaurant in 2019 and the people that actually bought it, the restaurant and still have it, I'm not the bank, so I'm not going back. But anyways, um, they continued that lease agreement, but switched it over to PFG. So it was through Ecolab. And with that said, you can negotiate everything on that lease agreement. I took the lease agreement and I crossed out the, the amount of chemical they wanted me to buy a month because I knew I would never use it. I also crossed out having to buy like their equivalent to Dawn dish detergent, uh, which I didn't think was very good. Um, so there, you don't have to accept every agreement. But yes, it was Ecolab. And I'll tell you, they were really good about servicing. I mean, every, it was probably at least twice a year, somebody would come in and test the machine and do all the cleanings and servicing on it, um, you know, for us. So it was, it was a saver. I wish I had done it a long time ago, actually. Yeah. Just to follow up on that. I've, I've got a lot of experience uh, using Ecolab with large restaurant groups and they are top notch. They really do a great job. Uh, yeah. The other thing I would point out too, there was a question earlier about, uh, uh, you know, should you purchase outright uh, and, you know, whether or not uh, you should lease. I mean, these are really good questions for your accountant. Uh, your accountant can give you really good advice as to equipment purchases and, you know, what effect that's going to have on your cash flow, your, your, your P&L, your balance sheet. Uh, so before you make a decision to spend cash on new equipment, you really should talk to your accountant in order to get his advice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this was great. Uh, does anyone else have yeah. any other? Yeah. If nobody else has anything to say, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dave Bork, and unfortunately, my background is not working quite right. So I'm going to just shut that off, and that way you can see my face a little bit better. Okay. Um, I, I'm an advisor and consultant to Fork Food Lab. I'm also a uh, uh, SCORE certified uh, mentor, although I'm not active currently with that because I'm devoting all my time to a Fork Food Lab as a volunteer. Uh, and um, I would ask, uh, you know, advise any of you who are just starting a new business, any new food business, whether it be consumer packaged goods or food service, uh, you know, Fork Food Lab is there for you and it will save you a lot of overhead because we charge hourly rates for the use of our shared space commercial kitchen. And we can certainly help you get up and going. Uh, a lot of people who are clients of SBDC, SCORE, CEI, 
uh, are also our members. So I would certainly, you know, ask that uh, if you're interested, uh, contact us at Food Work Fork Lab, and we can uh, give you more information about uh, the advantages of joining. Thanks for that. Yeah, there are so many resources available for the small business owners of Maine. Um, we want everyone to stay connected and in touch. Uh, I will follow up after this with the main SBDC contact information and Chris in particular, so that if you have any further specific restaurant questions, you can reach out to her. Uh, like we said, we are here for whatever questions you have. So uh, we will include our website, which has resources, e-courses, other events, and then a big orange button in the corner that says request advising. And we highly suggest that you click that and follow through. It'll put you in touch with uh, our data bank of advisors and we can put you in touch with either someone in your area, like location wise, but because we are doing everything via Zoom right now, it, we might be able to connect you with somebody who's very specific to your industry. Um, and so in this case, Chris is really great with restaurants. Uh, so if there aren't any other questions, I don't see anything in the chat. We will give you 10 minutes back of your morning. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Everyone have a lovely day. Thank you, everyone.